Thank you, Scott, and good evening, everybody. And uh, sorry, I had to make such a dramatic entrance. I <laughs> was locked out for a little bit, but I'm here. Um, so, uh, you know, the 4th of July always, uh, in addition to bringing terror to my dog with fireworks, um, gives me some reflection on freedom. And when I think about freedom, I think about recovery and addiction. And so I always kind of want to um, reflect, I think, on, on the 4th of July and independence and freedom, what that means in terms of just a life of recovery and um, what the changes that can mean in our own lives as we move into um, really living with freedom and hope and possibility and a lot of these more positive words that we might not have uh, had a lot of in our lives for, for a long time. So, you know, when we think about freedom from, uh, in terms of what, what addiction looks like and in terms of a lack of freedom, I think, you know, we get taught in when we're in our addictions in that same old cycle, right? Of the cycle of, of sadness and despair and hopelessness and confusion. And just, I remember that being caught up in that and thinking it can't get much worse and it does. You know, those cycles seem to get darker and and even more um, deeper and, and more serious. And um, with that comes, I think, this kind of futile attempt that nothing will work to get us out of it. So I just, I, I, when I think back on that headspace of addiction, how kind of hopeless we feel that the contrast with, you know, recovery and being truly free from that is, is, is really remarkable. Um, I remember just this will date me in my addiction, but back when I was um, bottoming out, back, it was back in the days of record players, believe it or not, and I, I had one record. It was too much for me to change the record. I couldn't change it. I just played the whole thing over and over again. And and happened to be a, a Joni Mitchell, very depressing one. And so I <laughs> kind of got, that was kind of locked into this. And I love Joni Mitchell, but I can't listen to her still. Um, that kind of deep, dark sadness and hopelessness that, that we had. Um, being trapped in my own story. You know, recovery for me, I meant freedom, freedom from this story of my life that I had, and, and mostly the story that I told myself about who I was and who I believed myself to be, and all those core beliefs that we talk about of being unworthy and unlovable and damaged goods and, you know, different than everybody else. And, you know, all that stuff that we as addicts um, do to ourselves in terms of the stories that we tell ourselves. And and with with recovery comes that freedom to recreate that story you know I, I literally created a new ending to my story and I don't know the ending yet right I'm still going but but it certainly is not the ending that would have been apparent uh, before I got into recovery when I was stuck in my addiction so freedom from that from that storyline and boy was I bored with it um, by the time I got out of it you know freedom from what what therapists call this victim triangle where we get caught up in this cycle of of rescuing people and then feeling unappreciated, and then we feel like a victim, and then we feel a victim. And that being a victim, by the way, for an addict is about the best there it can be because we can drink and act out and feel sorry for ourselves and do all that. And then when we feel highly victimized enough, we can act out against other people because they're not treating us the way we feel we deserve to be respected. So just being caught up in that cycle and not knowing how to get out of it, you know, recovery from man, freedom from from that trap, freedom from my limited belief system, um, where everything was catastrophic, everything was overgeneralized, everything was black and white, either I do this or it's going to be that. I was caught up in these very simplistic constructs that were kind of designed to keep my addiction going. They didn't really reflect reality very much, but it was very distorted and it was very, very much a trap. Um, freedom from the beliefs that I was a victim of circumstances, that I had no role and where my life had gotten to, that I had no choice in terms of picking myself and getting out of the situation, that I had no agency in, in doing something about what was going on, right? I just preferred to kind of be, feel sorry for myself and be victimized and, and kind of act out, uh, sometimes in anger at other people, but uh, not a great life. And then finally, you know, for me, recovery, stepping out of that world of addiction meant freedom to no longer be defined by my past. You know, in the past that included trauma and a lot of adverse experiences and a lot of bad things. And I didn't have to be a victim of that anymore. I could work on that. I could move past that. I could heal from that. And that was tremendously um, 
freeing because I never considered that possibility before that I could like move beyond that that, 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 that that was even an option. So for me, that's all the stuff I left behind. So for me, freedom in terms of recovery means freedom to find real sustaining joy if I choose, right? If I choose in my recovery every day to find joy that's sustainable, to find things that are joyful. And, and every day in my life, like all of our lives, there are things that aren't so joyful, right? Things that are sad and, and um, you know, people get sick and 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 worse, right? And, and things go, go south, but there's still moments of joy. And I can still be grateful that I can be present for whatever those circumstances in my life are, no matter what. I can, I can be free to learn from them something. I can, I can pick myself up and learn from a mistake I made and not have to make that again. I can find meaning and purpose. You know, I had no meaning or purpose in my life when I was actively engaged in my addiction, except to keep the addiction going and to protect that at all costs. But once that was freed up, I had kind of my life back. And that's sort of, okay, now what? And, and to really find some meaning and purpose and, and to really embrace some of those principles we see in the 12 steps and the 12 step particularly in terms of taking this message and doing something with it. And, and I've really tried to embrace that both in my personal life and my my professional life, you know, and really throwing my addiction overboard as my purpose and moving into something else. And finally, the, the freedom to find healthy connection, which is everywhere around me. And it was, it was always around me and I never saw it before. I never chose to engage it. And really healthy connection I've discovered is the, the key to ongoing recovery. And finally, for me, I guess, for all the stuff that still needs to be cleaned up in my life and worked on and, and all the situations that occur, I think there's the freedom to have hope, hope for real change, hope for real recovery, because I've seen it already. You know, there has been change and there has been recovery. And I have every faith that if I keep doing what I need to do and I have the freedom to do that, um, the, the outcome will be good and the outcome will be the same. And, and so I think that to me, when I think about the bondage of addiction and the irony of my resistance to the first step, which involves kind of surrender and maybe powerlessness. And I was so caught up in um, hanging on to that sense of control I had. When I look back at my small little world and being caught up in that, that addictive cycle, kind of really in the dark and scared and panicked almost, and, and contrasting that with the freedom and the brightness and light and openness and connection of recovery, um, I wouldn't choose anything else. So I just, I guess I'll take my 4th of July celebration to really celebrate recovery, recovery from the, the bondage of addiction and uh, and the gift of, of recovery itself. And I think that I'll stop. Thanks, Scott. Um, thank you, David. Um, uh, just that last bit, I'm reminded of, uh, I heard this in an AA room. Uh, I think it's fairly common. Somebody said, everything I've ever let go of has claw marks all over it. Right. Um, and even the things I needed to let go of and wanted to let go of, <laughs> I just still clawed into them. And, and you know, like, like the addiction, um, you know, because, and I think it's because, you know, the addiction, it is this cycle of despair that we feel trapped in. Um, and we just bounce around in, in this cycle and feel like nothing can change, even when we want it to change. What what's the turning point between, you know, this this might work for other people, but it's never going to work for me, and actually saying, okay, um, I'll do what you say. Maybe it'll work for me. You know, and a, a, they call it become willing to be willing. Uh, what's the turning point from this can't possibly help me to maybe. For me, it was that point we talk about where the pain of staying where I was just was more painful than the potential pain of doing something different by going to a meeting and trying to give it up. And I think just it just got so painful to be in my addiction that I had to sort of, okay, okay I'll, I'll take a chance. It can't be worse. And that, and for a long time, I wouldn't, I refused to believe that. But then even then, once I was willing to do that, I, it wasn't a miraculous change, right? It took a while. 
And for me, I had to, for quite a while, I had to really go and act as if. And, and I looked around and I saw a few other people. Um, and, and I, there were, I went to meetings in New York City. They were very mixed with a lot of sobriety and a lot of newcomers. And, you know, I, there were people with 20 and 30 year sobriety in the rooms, which was kind of interesting to me, but really meant nothing because I could, that was so far beyond anything I could relate to. But there were also people that were like 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. That was more interesting to me because I could relate to those people. And I, and I watched them day after day, week after week in the beginning. And, and I could see them starting to change. And I thought, well, if they can change, maybe, maybe I can change too. Right. And, and I think it's just, it was like believing, well, first of all, knowing that I had to be there, no choice. And then just kind of hoping and trusting that it would happen to me. And it did. And I think it was, it was that phase of kind of acting as if, as kind of a middle ground, I guess, is the best way to describe it for me. Okay. So, but we'll, we'll actually become willing when the disease bottoms out to the point where it now looks worse than however it is we view the cure, uh, um, which we usually view the cure as, oh my God, I have to go to those boring meetings and sit with those weird, people who, you know, dress funny and smell bad and smoke cigarettes and, um, <laughs> you know, drink bad coffee and go to therapy, you know, all that stuff sounds horrible um, right. when we first start. And, and the good news is, as you talked about, you know, we suddenly, we, we have, once we're freed of this, you know, belief that we have, or these beliefs that we have, you know, the contempt prior to investigation, Yes. Um, we we start to see that we have choice, in, you know, in our day. And my addiction, you know, I woke up and the first thing I did was smoke a joint. It was rolled on the bedside table waiting for me in the morning um, to wait. I, I didn't get out of bed. And then I started my day and, you know, usually did a little pot smoking or drinking at lunch and uh, had a joint uh, waiting in the car for the way home. And then my sex life started. Um, you know, already high, sometimes drunk, you know, and I had no choices during my day. My, my choice was, you know, do I want pizza or a sandwich for lunch? I mean, that was the, like, the biggest choice I ever made right. in, in a day. Now I have a choice. I wake up and I can do whatever I want. I mean, most days I choose to come to work because I enjoy work, but, you know, I always have choices and I never had choices in my addiction i mean for me that is just knowing i i can do anything i want after this webinar there's nothing on my agenda i can watch tv i can read a book i can go for a walk i can play with the cats i, I go out to dinner you know i can do whatever i want is nice and then the other aspect of freedom for me um this occurred for me about a year into sobriety um when I started looking around and the world no longer looked drab. Yeah. Um, it was like I had my, I called them my little kid eyes. I had the eyes of a little kid again, where everything is fresh and new and nothing looks daunting. Everything looks like an adventure. <laughs> and it, it was like, I was like, oh my God, this is the total opposite of my addiction where everything was in black and white and you know, muddy black and white, like an old black and white film. And, and it all looks like too much to handle. Like you said, you couldn't even change the record player. I thought you were going to tell me it was like Patsy Cline, which would have been even worse than Shelly Mitchell, but. <laughs> <laughs> I probably wouldn't have survived that. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but, but yeah, I, I got like fresh eyes and, and I've kept them throughout my recovery. Yeah. Um, very little looks like too difficult these days, even the stuff that probably should look too difficult sometimes. But, uh, you know, everything's an adventure. I'm like, okay, well, I'll take that on. Let's, let's see what happens. Um, and sometimes I fail and that's, that's okay. I do have one question for you. Um, you said we're, I don't know if I heard this or you said it, but, or it's a combination, but we're, we're moving toward, we're free to move toward reality which I think is, is a big aspect of addiction because, you know, addiction is avoiding reality. Recovery is committing to reality. Um, 
but not reality as our warped little minds misperceive it, basically. I've heard that addiction is a disease of perception. Could you explain that a little bit and what happens to that when we get into recovery? Yeah, it's a really good point. And I think, you know, one of the expressions we talk about a lot is kind of the, the, the stories we tell ourselves, right? And I think a lot of times our reality is, is a construct and there are certain events that are, you know, absolute events that absolutely occurred, but it's kind of how we, um, the spin we put on them, the, 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 our role in it, our reaction to it and all that kind of grows over time and there's family lore that get, gets in there. But, but my point is that over time with addiction and our memories, I and mean, most of us have trauma or some kind of adverse childhood experience, you know, a, a troubled childhood, let me say that, um, all that kind of comes together and creates this, this place that a lot of us kind of want to not spend much time in, in our reality. And so we we check out, right? I early on learned how to kind of step out of my reality into this fantasy world. And, and in the beginning, it was with reading or music. It was kind of very productive or daydreaming, which may be not so productive. Um, but later, it, it you know, when I found substances, those I already knew how to kind of dissociate. Those substances really just pulled me right into this like fantasy world, which is about the polar opposite of, of reality, right? And, and that was really kind of where I spent most of my addiction and my, where I did interface with the real world, I kind of, it was very skewed in terms of how I interpreted things and what I thought people were thinking of me. And it wasn't very reality-based. Recovery kind of shattered all that old illusion stuff. And over time, and this is not something any of us can do quickly, but I think we have to kind of come to terms with, with the reality of who we are. And a lot of that means letting go of old false beliefs about ourselves, so, you know, whether we're, you know, these negative core beliefs, we call them, like I'm, I'm unworthy, I'm unlovable, you know, all that stuff. Um, and kind of rewriting some of that, maybe rethinking our roles, maybe seeing where we did have some choice or do have some choice in our current life. So I think somehow for me, it was when I started also connecting with people, getting perspective, allowing myself to hear other people's opinions of my situation or get feedback on me, which I didn't like to hear at first. Um, all that kind of real world feedback from people I trusted who had no agenda except to be there, you know, be helpful. Um, all that gradually started to change how I viewed me and the world. And I think, and, and what I ended up with was a much more, a truer, um, impression of reality, right? Of just of who I am and what's and what's going on and and how I operate in the world, um, for better or for worse. Not, it's not all everything, not everything's not all perfect, but I had, I think I had a much more realistic view of it um, without the temptation to kind of avoid and fall back and just numb by drop by stepping back into that fantasy world that that was my go-to place when the real world got too intense. And um, and do I still have that urge sometimes? <laughs> yeah, I do. You know, but but then I have other tools to kind of stay in the real world and and work it through. And I think that's the important part. Um, yeah, we we've talked about negativity bias. I mean, that's sort of addicts walk around with a, a negativity exactly. bias. We're always waiting for, expecting that things are going to go bad, and so we might as well get drunk or high or look at porn or, or whatever. I mean, it's part of our denial. Well, the world stinks, you know, so why bother? I mean, it's part of our denial, but it's also becomes part and parcel of who we are and how we deal with everything in the world. Um, and, you know, when we commit to reality, we see that oh, the world's not quite as bad as other people aren't quite as awful as I thought they were. Um, and it, it's it's a nice feeling. And, and I'll tell you, Scott, the, the tool that we talk about all the time in this webinar what really helped me, a very simple one is gratitude, right? Gratitude is the way that I was able to kind of start to make sense of certain things and see that it wasn't all bad or to say to maybe look at this aspect or that aspect and be grateful for something. And it really started to balance out my attitude about things in my life. So I think just, I can't say enough about gratitude and, and the, what a simple, exquisitely beautiful tool that is to use yeah. and powerful, powerful, powerful. Yeah, we're both big fans of gratitude. I do a gratitude list every day. That's how I start my day. Um, and sometimes I do it more than once a day. Um, 
So let's jump into the Q&A here. Um, sure. Type some questions into the Q&A. David and I will answer them. Um, so this first one, um, I'm a sex addict. My wife and I are separated. Whenever we talk, I continue to have trouble showing empathy toward her. Uh, is this something that I will eventually get? I know I need to say something to her when she's hurting, but I just can't find the words. Um, empathy, tough one. David, thoughts? <laughs> right. Um, yeah, so I guarantee you're not alone. Um, this is a big issue, and it's a big issue that, that I really encourage you to continue working on. I'm really glad you're identifying this as a problem because uh, this is a classic, right? And empathy to remember is, is defined as feeling what someone else is feeling. And we, we as human beings are hardwired to be able to have empathy, um, but to be able to really feel what somebody else is feeling, we have to be pretty adept at feeling what we're feeling. And so we can interpret what somebody else is feeling and compare it to, what, to our own you know, internal sensations. Most addicts are just waking up their own internal feeling system, right? We're numb or we're out of touch with a lot of feelings that may be anger or resentment, or whatever. And so in the beginning, um, we really encourage the recovering addict to work on developing their own feelings um, while they sort of practice some uh, compassion and empathy skills for their partner. It's going to take a while. Um, now, what, what I would suggest, um, there are, there are ways to start practicing the skills without having to really have it come right from your heart space. So you can learn ways of practicing compassionate and empathic communication styles. In other words, saying the right thing. And eventually that starts to connect with your own heart and you start to feel it more. But, but in a way, in the meantime, you're modeling for yourself how to do that. There are different communication um, aspects out there. One, one thing I find very helpful, uh, DBT, which is dialectical behavioral therapy. DBT is a subset of psychotherapy, but it, it's an all skill-based um, uh, skills, some of which is compassion and empathy skills. And they're, they're great ways to kind of start to practice this. Um, just as a, as a teaser, we're gonna have an intimacy skills uh, workshop coming up for men. Uh, in recovery, probably in a couple of months to, to launch. We're gonna cover some of this. Probably September, we'll launch it. September. Yeah. Um, but but I think this is a, it's a stressful thing for everybody. And I think it's easy to mess it up and say the wrong thing. I've had a lot of uh, guys in recovery with all the good intention in the world, try to say something and it falls flat or is, or their partner finds it offensive, or you know, just there's a lot of chance for miscommunication. So I guess I, I encourage, even though the partners are um, obviously have a lot of their own betrayal trauma and a lot of strong feelings, I I think if partners can be a little gentle and, and work with their um, their addict and in, in terms of the communication styles, this can be really helpful. Um, so one other thing I'll just mention in terms of communication, there's an Imago dialogue that's a step by step uh, uh, way to to break down the, the communication process just to make it clearer. Um, and these are, again, these are therapy techniques that most therapists can guide you through. If you're in, seeing a CSAT or a therapist, I suggest you talk to them about this or a couples therapist. A any therapist can give you some tips and skills to do this. I think the, the key to this is having a good intention to start with and then to sort of continue practicing. Um, and get feedback and it's and with the expectation that it's going to be awkward anytime we start to try to express our feelings it doesn't come out very smoothly or you know and it may fall flat but i i really think that trying is the key um but i really do think ultimately if you're not connecting with your own feelings it's going to be hard for you to identify what your partner's feeling and that's the whole point of empathy obviously yeah um is empathy something that we're usually born with, that we kind of crush with our addiction? Or uh, DBT is dialectical behavior therapy, uh, to answer the question in the chat feature. Um, is it something we're born with and crush with our addiction, or do some of us not have it? And either way, I know that we need to learn or relearn the skill. How does that work? Right. So 
every human being, unless there's some weird physical problem, every human being is born with, with the apparatus, the hardwire, and we need for, for empathy, right? And including mirror neurons and all these kind of cool, really cool brain things that are wired together. But that's the hardware. We, the other things can go wrong, right? If we are have any kind of trauma as children or adverse childhood experiences, that ability to feel compassion or empathy for somebody can really get damaged. And that's a self-preservation system, by the way. If we're in a very abusive system, family system, um, it just isn't safe from a survival point of view to just be open and empathetic for everybody, right? We have to kind of close down out of self-preservation. So, so family of origin issues can cause it. Addiction can cause it. As I mentioned, particularly sex addiction, porn addiction, um, these uh, high intensity addictions, chem sex addiction, they're all notorious for being really quite abusive toward partners in terms of just being numb uh, toward the effects, the emotional impact of what, what happens. And, and, and it's weird because oftentimes guys will be intellectually aware of what's going to happen, but they're just not connecting with the feelings of it, which is we do a lot of work in our residential program in LA for that. So, so there are things, things can go wrong, um, but unless somebody's just an absolute narcissist or antisocial person, and most people are narcissists that come through uh, sex addiction treatment, but if, if, if they're antisocial or a sociopath, those people really have the, they're incapable of feeling that, but that's, that's a really minor exception. So I would say most people that come through seeking integrity have the capability. It may take some therapy. It may take some trauma therapy. It may take some time, but I think it's a, it's a matter of reestablishing that innate ability that we have. It may have been damaged early on. Um, I suspect most people do most of the damage in their active addiction, which means it's more reversible in recovery than the longstanding stuff. Can you but tell I me think, about the NYU study about what meth addiction does to us? Yeah, so I, I mentioned that you know the the four, well, the three really most intense, uh, yeah, high impact, devastating things on empathy are, are sex addiction, porn addiction, and chem sex, amphetamines and sex. And there was um, a study at NYU on empathy and methamphetamine, and they showed uh, active meth users a picture of a man, same man, making, showing uh, faces with different emotions, happy, sad, angry, disappointed, um, very clear, you know, things that even a child could say, okay, that's a happy face, that's not. These meth users were unable to distinguish the emotion that was being conveyed. Uh, the, the meth had impacted their ability to read empathy and read someone's body language and facial expression. And facial expression, by the way, is a key source subconsciously, but it's a key source of information for our, our empathy, our mirror neurons to say, what's going on with this person? Uh, and with these addictions, it gets all messed up. And so like with the meth person, everything got basically interpreted from a hostile point of view. So the a happy face, somebody could be smiling at the person, but the meth addict would think, boy, that's a really evil grin, right? Everything, everything kind of became a, a little bit paranoid. Uh, so anyway, these addictions really mess with our ability to properly read what other people are thinking and doing. So yeah, that gets better, but it takes some work. Yeah. Um, how common is a polygraph post uh, or after Full therapeutic disclosure. What are the pros and cons, David? Do you mind if I just take this one? Go ahead. Okay. Um, I worked with Steph Carnes on her book, Courageous Love, which is all about disclosure. I highly recommend it. Um, Steph is a fan of the polygraph. I personally am a fan of the polygraph. Um, Steph is a fan because um, it lets the betrayed partner know, yes, everything is out. I'm a fan because I'm an addict. Um, it forces the addict to get everything. If I know I'm going to take a polygraph, I'm, I'm darn well going to get it all down on paper and give it to you because then I want to pass my polygraph so I can go see, now you know everything. Um, not every CSAT will use a polygraph. Um, I think the trend is more and more to use a polygraph. I would say probably two thirds to 75% of the guys I deal with in, in the work groups when they're doing their full therapeutic disclosure, they were also doing a polygraph. Um, the pro is it, it kind of forces you to do it right. And it lets your partner know 
that you got it all out. The con is if you're trying to hide stuff, you're going to get caught. Um, the polygraphs are simple. Everybody thinks that they're going to be trick questions and all of this. They do, you know, is your name David Fawcett? Yes. Uh, do you live in blah, blah, blah? Yes. You know, they give you about five yes, no questions like that to, to establish a baseline. And then they go, did you, you tell the truth in your disclosure? Yes. Did you leave anything out? No. Okay, we're done. <laughs> you know, that's it. Um, there are no trick questions. There are no, it's, they just want to, so um, if you're worried about the polygraph, don't be. Um, just make sure you get it all out in the disclosure. David, do you have, have anything to add to that? No, I think that's pretty accurate and kind of how I feel too. I have more recently too heard of um, some polygraphs being used uh, on kind of an ongoing basis, uh, a couple of times in the first year yeah. after that. Maintenance polygraphs, yeah. And maintenance polygraphs, yeah. Um, I, I initially was not a fan of polygraphs, um, but I, I have come to see the benefit of them in terms of uh, establishing a clean baseline and a, a kind of a new clean slate and a new beginning and with some reassurance for the partner. So yeah, I'm more of a fan now for sure. Yeah. Um, now, if you ask this question on a webinar that Tammy's on, you're going to get a very different answer. She's very anti-polygraph. Um, I can't convince her otherwise. So yeah, um, but I'm a fan. Uh, can you talk a little bit about strategies to help or even coexist with people, particularly family and a spouse uh, who had stuck it out so far, who I love, but I have hurt terribly when at the height of my addiction with the lying, the cheating, the hiding, uh, faking nearly everything about my life, including professing love uh, when that was clearly at odds with my actions. So this is uh, an addict, I believe, who has hurt um, parents, siblings, spouse, um, who are sticking with him or her. Um, but, you know, what does he do to repair this, I think is the question. Right. You know, I think, first of all, good for you. And I think understanding, well, first of all, it's a big awareness sometimes to really take in to our hearts, the extent to which we've hurt somebody we love in terms of a partner, but then to realize it extends even beyond that, right? To family, extended family, siblings and so on. And, and the depth of, of um, harm can, can be quite extensive. And so what do we do about that? And that's your question. I think the, the best thing I can recommend um, is, is what I would say kind of an amends, an amends in terms of behavioral amends. You know, we, we talk a lot about apologies being words, words cheap. How many times do addicts say, I'm sorry, I'll never do that again. I can do better. I mean, all that stuff, those are just kind of useless wastes of air. But I think if we, the, the one thing I think that people want to see is consistent behavior change and, and the trust that um, what we say we're going to do, we'll follow through with and we live with some integrity. And so I think doing that over time is the best way you can do. I, I don't know of any quick, speedy way to reestablish trust in us from our family members, except to just live in integrity. And if we say we're gonna do something, do it and come clean. And if we have a little problem, come clean about it really fast and, and work uh, as pure a program as we can. And I'm not sure what more to do. There's, you know, there's work, I think, as a therapist, I, I think there's always room, um, in addition to that kind of living in integrity, to take specific relationships within the family. And some of those may need work at certain times. I think sometimes a, a couple of sessions even with the therapist can really go a long way toward healing a relationship that's kind of stuck sometimes. Um, so I think there's, a, and, and also by the way, the 12 steps give us a tremendous pathway to provide some of that healing in terms of um, doing some some moral inventories of ourselves and and processes for making amends as well. So I think there's some structure both in in the twelve steps and in uh, therapeutic processes and and in just in terms of how we live. So I, I think that is pretty much the key element. Scott, is there other stuff that you can think of? That... Yeah, I always want to jump right into the twelve steps because first of all, we all want to be well and fix it now. And 
this is going to take some time. You're going to have to display some sobriety and some honesty uh, before people start to trust you again and, and, and to relax around you again. And the steps, you know, where we make amends, it's step nine. It's not step one. Step one is I have a problem. Step two is I need help. Step three is I'll accept some help. You know, step four, we start identifying. We take a searching and fearless moral inventory. We identify the, the injuries that we've caused to others and ourselves. Um, and then step five is we share about that usually with our sponsor or a therapist or some people in recovery. And then step six and seven, we identify our character defects and start working on them. If we start to work to become better people, and then step eight, we make a list of people we've harmed and become ready to make events. We don't actually do it yet. We make the list and then we sit down with our sponsor and we have a really long conversation about who's on the list and did we get it right in terms of identifying the harms we've caused? And in addition to apologizing, what are we gonna to do to make amends? Which means make things right. You know, if I owe you money, I'm gonna pay you the money or I'm gonna come up with a payment plan, whatever. Um, and I'm going to live differently, mostly. Most sex porn uh, addicts, the real amends is living differently in the future. Um, and that's step nine out of 12. And, and, you know, 10 is a repeat of four through nine. And, and then 11 and 12 are spirituality carrying the message. Um, but we're most of the way through the steps before we start trying to fix our relationships with other people. Um, we got to do a whole lot of work on ourselves first. Um, and when people see us doing that work on ourselves, they're a lot more likely to receive the idea that, yes, I want to apologize and make amends and live differently. Um, but this takes, uh, you know, Dr. Rob says with spouses, it, it generally takes at least a year um, before they start really trusting you again. Uh, and that's if you do everything right. <laughs> It's if you don't relapse at the six month mark or, you know, so it's going to take a while before, uh, you know, the people around you feel comfortable with you, but they want to love and trust you. They're still with you. Uh, that's the good news. So they want this to happen too. And the fact that you're aware that you've hurt them and it's the lying and the cheating and the hiding and the faking everything. Um, that's what you're going to have to make amends for. And it's going to be mostly a living events. I think I just repeated everything David said, but <laughs> it's a very nice way. I like to. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. As I said that, I was like, I'm just parroting David. Great. Um, can you mention some tools to use to stop an addict from going into the mindset of seeing their partner as the opposition when they are pointing pointing out warning signs to the addict? Um, I do this to my wife. I know we are on the same side and her motives come from a good place, but I often feel like she is searching for the negative and throwing it at me. Um, and then I become defensive and resentful rather than using the information to self-assess my state of mind and avoid escalating. This is an excellent question because it happens all the time. Yeah, it sure does. Um, this is a, it's an interesting area, right? And it's, a little bit of a setup sometimes because um, we don't want our partners to be the uh, the sheriff in town, right? That has to to control or take responsibility for us or keep us on track. Um, but it's certainly a legitimate um, feedback with if they observe something to point it out to us. And I think it's it's the responsibility of the addict to be able to receive that feedback um, with grace <laughs> and and uh, humility and. And with the with the spirit with which it was intended, which is to be helpful, right? Not to be critical. I think it's when we have that kind of edge to us. I think we need to kind of check that and see what's going on there, because that there's old resentments, probably old patterns that I think can only get us in trouble and old assumptions. And I think I would I would if you're in therapy, you're seeing somebody, I would maybe take take a situation or two where that has occurred and really deconstruct it in terms of um, not so much about your partner, but what, what, what happened with you internally? What was what was your inside process? What did you tell yourself about what, what she said, about um, what that meant, about where she was coming from, about what that meant about you, about her? And, and I think you'll find that there's a lot of assumptions there that probably aren't very helpful. And they may be assumptions that are kind of left over 
from before. Um, so anyway, I think just really trying to keep your side of the street as clean as possible on that. Um, sometimes we've talked about, you know, act as if, and, and it may be useful to just kind of say thank you and, and process it and, um, and get some feedback on the same factor. Maybe there's some, some, something your wife has observed and I would take that to your sponsor and say, look, this is the feedback I just got. What do you think? And so, so to do a reality check on that and see, and I think you'll probably find that the feedback you're getting is, is well-intended and, and good. And I think the reactions you're having are probably coming from an old place um, of a kind of irritability and a little bit defensiveness. Um, and when we find defensiveness uh, on the part of the addict, that's, you know, the low grade defensiveness is, is one thing that can kind of grow and, and escalate into something more troublesome to me in terms of a sign that there's more resistance to the process. So just be, take that as a warning sign for that. But I think I would just um, sit down and the other thing to do that I, just occurs to me, hopefully you're doing daily check-ins with your partner. I would, I would process this um, and just see what comes up. Um, so I, I love the stem sentence like when you said X, Y, Z, it made me feel, you know, X, Y, Z. So when you, when you gave me that feedback, it made me feel, and I would go try to be really honest with yourself. If you're feeling resentful, remember under every resentment is a much more core feeling. And I, and that's usually hurt, fearful, afraid, um, not usually anger. Anger is there, but if you drill down underneath, I would bet there's some other feeling that's going to be much more productive for you to get in touch with. And so I think just that I would explore this with your wife a little bit. Um, and I think it would also help kind of heal um, or facilitate the communication there as well. So I just, I would not be afraid to talk about these dynamics, um, but I would certainly own the fact that much of this is probably a reaction on your part that is a little out of place, frankly, that could be, um, you could pull the plug on a little bit with some work, I bet. Yeah. And, you know, there's the, the couple's dialoguing techniques like Imago dialogue and EFT dialoguing. Mm -hmm. You slow your conversation down and you kind of just say, okay, I heard you say you don't want me to go bowling tonight. Is that what you said? No, I said, I worry when you go bowling. <laughs> oh, you worry when I go bowling. I think that you probably worry because sometimes I have a beer or two when I go bowling and then I'm more susceptible to acting out. Did I get that right? Yes, you, you, you did. I worry that you'll go bowling and you'll be having a good time and you'll knock back a couple of beers and hit on the waitress and you know, that scares me. And it's hard to be mad when you understand that it's not that she doesn't want you to go bowling, it's that she's scared when you go bowling. Uh, she feels unsafe when you go bowling. And that's a very different conversation. Right. Um, what can I do to help you feel safe? Because uh, I really would like to go bowling. <laughs> oh, well, you know, you could promise me that you won't drink and, you know, you can take some pictures of you having a soda instead of a beer and text that to me, you know, whatever it is, um, or maybe, you know, why don't you come bowling with me, <laughs> you know, or whatever, I, you know, if it's a league or something, obviously that, that kind of thing doesn't happen. Um, but slow it down and find the feelings underneath it um, because it, it is incumbent on you, uh, on you as the addict to give here. Um, your, right. your partner's not the one who cheated, your partner, will learn to ask questions or to voice their concerns. Hopefully if they come to our groups and do the betrayed partner work group and things like that, they'll learn to voice their concerns in ways that are less triggering for you. But it's incumbent upon you right now when you're triggered to, to not get defensive and to say, did I hear, I heard this, is that what you said? I um, mean, that's a good way to start. Um, and then you can parse it and, and kind of get on the same page without getting offensive. Um, anything to add to that or? No, that was beautiful. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I've, been, I've been hanging out with John Taylor and Matt Wheeler on Thursdays and Fridays. They're couples experts. They have webinars on Thursdays and Fridays. Um, um, I hear the term falling on your own sword in relation to what the addict needs to do in repairing relationships. Can you expand on this? Give examples. 
you know, I think, um, I, I guess I like to think of it in terms of the addict taking responsibility for what's happened. And um, Scott actually just kind of gave an example just now where the addict really has to take, the burden is on the addict, the onus is on the addict, right? To to analyze the behavior and not get defensive and really see what's going on. Because the addict is the one that kind of has, has strayed out of proper behavior and needs to kind of come back in line. And so I think the onus is on the addict. So I think he gets to talk about following your own sword. I think that I don't necessarily care for that metaphor, uh, just because it it seems um, a little bit kind of over dramatic to me. I, I like the terms of just taking the addict where the addict takes responsibility for what they've done and, and correcting the situation. Um, and and you know when we talk about taking responsibility, then I think the addict really does need to just do it. Um, when we talk about, you know, when we're doing discharge planning for our guys going home from seeking integrity, when I'm working with a couple talking about, okay, what, can he come home to the house? You know, is he going to sleep in the basement or in the same bed or where, how's that all going to work? Um, basically my, my view at that point is whatever the spouse wants, the spouse gets because uh, she or he uh, is calling the shots, right? The spouse. Um, the addict really, and so I guess you could say in that sense that the addict needs to fall on their sword because they, re they really need to kind of go with whatever the spouse needs to help the spouse feel safe, uh, emotionally safe when they come back into that world. Um, so in that sense, the, there's a lot of sacrifice that needs to be made. However, it's, I, don't, um, I don't want to in any way play into like being a victim or, um, you know, being a burden, right? This is something that um the the addict totally owns based on the the nature of what they've done and it's the it's the path to healing so if that if you want to call it following their sword fine i i call it kind of taking responsibility and and doing the right thing and and working uh to 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 clean up um the system and the mess that i've made and and i think that what's frustrating sometimes for the addict is that um as we've indicated in a couple of the last questions that process can take a long time Right, that trust just doesn't happen overnight. Doesn't happen quickly. It takes it takes a while, and that can be frustrating for everybody. Because, um, and I work with a lot of addicts, obviously, and you know when when that change of heart occurs, it really occurs. I mean, these guys feel in their heart things have changed. I'm different, and they want their spouse to understand they're different as well. And and two different timetables. It just doesn't happen that fast with the, the, the partner. And, and changes need to happen as well for the addict. There's a sense of different, but there's a whole lot of work to be done. So um, I would just, uh, communication. I think to go, I'm going to default back to the answer we gave before with just people need to talk to each other. And uh, there's no need for uh, blame or you know, recriminations or anything else. It's just a matter of uh, taking responsibility and doing the right thing. And I think if there's a question of who should, where the burden should fall, uh, I think it should fall on the addict in, in the early part of the process. This doesn't mean you don't get to have healthy boundaries or engage in self-care. You, you do. Um, but if your partner says, I'm not comfortable with you right now, I'd like you to sleep in the other room, that's probably pretty reasonable. That's your partner, I need some safety right now, and that does not involve you. Please go in the other room. If the boundary that your partner tries to set is you will sleep in the actual doghouse outside, even though it's 20 below, that is not reasonable. Um, so you can set a boundary. No, I need to be safe too. I'll sleep on the couch in the basement. Um, or, you know, but I mean, that's kind of an extreme example, but give a little, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you wouldn't be here if you hadn't done what you did so give a little um, exactly. yeah and sometimes give a lot you might have to um okay this next one i think will probably be our last one for the day um my my betraying partner uh says i told him years ago um that because of my health uh, knowing i could not meet all his sexual needs adequately to do whatever he needed during this time um it sounds so out of character for me to say something like that but he's insistent um, I'm so over being accused of gaslighting and I, I just want to agree and move on. Um, should I, or should I insist? I don't remember. 
uh, and try to deal and then try to deal with his accusations or should I just give in? Um, so the betrayed partner has some physical issues and can't meet all of the betraying partner's sexual needs. And he says that she said uh, it was okay to cheat, basically. Um, and she's saying, I didn't say that. Um, so what should this individual do? And maybe talk a little bit about the gaslighting end of it too, if you can, David. Right. Yeah, so this is a tricky situation. I think what, what you don't want to do in this situation is just say, okay, well, maybe, right. maybe I did. <laughs> because, you know, with these relationships that have been kind of um, affected by addiction and the gaslighting that's occurred and the dishonesty and the, the sort of swirling around of and confusion of facts and statements over the years, um, there's a lot of distrust and a lot of kind of shaky foundations for a healthy relationship. And I think to kind of just move forward on that shaky foundation would be a kind of a, a bad formula for success down the road. Um, I, I think to me, that's the kind of conversation that I think is pretty memorable um, in a relationship. <laughs> I would think you'd remember saying that. Saying, I don't know. <laughs> you know, maybe that's just me. Uh, but, you know, and given the history of gaslighting, it, it's certainly suspect. Um, I think it's the kind of conversation that really needs to take place to get it worked out, where you come to some agreement, um, uh, some reality-based agreement of what happened. Or, uh, because, and I don't think it's good for you to just concede, well, maybe that happened, because that's just kind of buying into some potential gaslighting with the, and uncertainty, and frankly, opens the door to more bad behavior, honestly. Um, you know, couples come to different kinds of arrangements, but this is not the way you want that to happen. And so I think having a bring that having that conversation over again in the context of uh, a third party, meaning a, a couples therapist or a therapist to help you guide you and kind of keep um, everybody honest, uh, mostly that your partner, um, in terms of what the language is, and to keep you from just kind of getting steamrolled into just saying, oh, I'm tired of this. I just, maybe I said it. Uh, that's not a healthy response for you. So I would I would kind of stick to your guns a little bit on this one, just because I think if you guys have a healthy chance at recovery in your relationship, it's really smart to get this worked out. So this kind of uncertainty and perhaps untruth isn't kind of at the heart of the relationship. Yeah. Down the road. And, and you know, whatever he convinced himself the relationship boundaries were in the past, clearly you're not okay with his version of it. Um, and, you know, that was then anyway, this is now. And right now I am not okay with this behavior. Right. Um, here is Good. why, here is how I feel when you behave this way. My boundary is if you do this again, I will, you know, we'll go to couples counseling or you'll have to leave the house or we'll get a divorce or, you know, if you're going to set a consequence, make sure it's one you're willing to follow through on. But the two of you need to be very, very clear about what the boundaries are starting this moment and moving forward. Um, you can hash out that whatever happened in the past and, you know, what you said versus what he heard, which are often not the same. Addicts are very good at interpreting your words uh, to suit their desires. Um, you know, I, I'm an addict. I'm just fessing up. Um, but yeah, you guys need to have healthy boundaries for now and moving forward. And to me, that would be much more of a focus right now than fighting about what was said, you know, years ago. Yeah. Um, so, and then we, if you're focused on in the moment and how are we going to get along at the moment, you're fighting the problem. If you're focused about what we said 10 years ago, you're fighting each other. Um, and it's a lot more fruitful for the relationship and for both of you as individuals to fight the problem instead of each other. Yeah. All right. So, for sure. Um, we're out of time. We're out of questions. That worked out well. Um, no webinar next week. Uh, we will not be here, um, but we'll be back on the 20th. Um, David will have Tammy with him on the 20th, and then it'll be back to David and I the week after that. Um, so everybody have uh, a great week off and we'll, we'll see you in two weeks. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. Take care. See everybody. Bye-bye.